How about a movie review on today's Hot Mic with Houston and Hogan? Yep, Dave's been to the movies, and he's here to tell us all about Killers of the Flower Moon. Let's listen in. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Hot Mic with Houston and Hogan. And it truly, truly is the highlight of my week to get together and share a microphone and studio with my old friend Dave Hogan. Howdy. Howdy, Randy. We were talking about the solemn old judge, George D. Hay, who uh, coined the phrase Grand Old Opry, and he would introduce it the Grand Old Opry. Let her go, boys. <laughs> I remember hearing that. So let's let her go, boys. A solemn old judge. It was originally, you know, the barn dance, WSM barn dance. Okay. And then the solemn old judge gave it the name, the Grand Ole Opry, because preceding the Grand Ole Opry on WSM radio was the Metropolitan Op Opera broadcast oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> back in the early days. And so the um, Metropolitan Opera broadcast out of New York would go off and they would immediately go to what we now call the Grand Ole Opry. So now you think about the contrast there. You really? <laughs> From the Metropolitan Opera and opera music to what was then called hillbilly music. Right. <laughs> so the solemn old judge somehow or another got the idea to, you know, we, we've just heard the Metropolitan Opera from New York. This is the Grand, Grand Ole Opry from Nashville, Tennessee. It was quite a culture change. That might have contributed to the writing of that song that they made famous on Hee Haw called the, uh, well, it was about Hee Haw, the Counter Revolution Hee Haw Polka or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> the uh, Grand Ole Opry uh, was a southern version of the barn dance out of uh, Chicago, WLS, the National Barn Dance. I think we referenced that when we had uh, Richard Hurley here on the uh, our program, and we were talking about Bascom Lamar Lunsford and yeah. Scotty Wiseman, who were at the National Barn Dance in Chicago, and got talking about uh, the, the song Old Mountain Dew that uh, Bascom had written, and, and Bascom didn't have the money to get back home, so he sold. Scotty gave him... I think it's twenty five dollars, which would be a pretty good little piece of change back in those days, uh, for the right to use Mountain Dew, and he rewrote some of the lyrics, and that's how that good old Mountain Dew song came about. But the WSM Barn Dance uh, preceding that was the WLS Barn Dance out of Chicago, and you know what WLS stood for no you know who owned wls put it on the air the sears and robot oh, okay the sears robot company and they called it the world's largest store wls world's largest store well fast forward and when i was growing up in the uh late 60s and uh, we we listened to am radio late at night and WLS, the big 89 in Chicago was one of those stations we pulled oh, in yeah. and got that rock and roll music. You bet. Yeah. You, uh, what, what was Beyonce, uh, Nick Beyonce, was that his name? I uh, may have been. May have one been. of the DJs there. Yeah. Became nationally famous from that clear channel radio it, station. It was a big one, man. And then when they started the, what's now the Grand Ole Opry, it was the WSM Barn Dance patterned after the National Barn Dance. And WSM was owned by the National Life and Accident Insurance Company. And we sell millions where they got WSM. Wow. Talking about selling insurance. Another big old powerful radio station. Hey, Randy, do you like to go to movies? Are well, you a movie buff? I am. Uh, not as much as I used to be, but when, one of the, uh, when a movie piques my interest, Yes, I'll go and sit in the movie theater by myself and watch a movie. In the town I live in or live near Waynesville, we have a small movie theater, but they have great sound. 
And uh, this movie called, here's the book, Killers of the Flower Moon. The book came out, and they made a movie. And I always have a hard time saying uh, the last name, but Martin Scorsese, the director and producer of many years and many movies, directed this, and he's 80 years old. It may be his last movie, but if I were him, I'd quit because this is a fantastic movie, and I recommend it to everybody that might be listening. And it's one of those movies that's going to be streamed. It's not streaming now. You have to go to a theater, which I like to do when there's a movie I really want to see. I like the big screen. I like the sound of a, a, a big movie theater. But this is the kind of movie that will be streaming for years and years and years. It is a fantastic movie based on a true story. Let me give you a little background uh, about what the movie's about. Okay. And then we'll tell you how country music kind of fits in with what we're talking about. In the 1920s, the richest people per capita in the world were members of the Osage Nation in Oklahoma. After oil was discovered beneath their land, they rode in chauffeured cars and lived in mansions. Now, mind you, this is an Indian reservation. Then one by one, the Osage began to be killed. Molly Burkhart watched as her family became a prime target. Her relatives were shot, some poisoned. Other Osage were also dying under mysterious circumstances, and many of those who investigated the crimes were themselves murdered. As the death toll rose, the case was taken up by the newly created FBI and its young director, J. Edgar Hoover. Struggling to crack the mystery, Hoover turned to a former Texas ranger named Tom White, who put together an undercover team, including a Native American agent. They infiltrated the last remnant of the Wild West and together with the Osage began to expose one of the most chilling conspiracies in American history. Now, that's the background of the story. The book is called Killers of the Flower Moon. And a tremendous uh, movie was made based on the book. And uh, the movie stars uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, Robert De Niro. Robert De Niro, yeah. And Lily Gladstone. Those are the three key actors in the movie. But uh, as far as acting is concerned, I saw more good acting. I'm not an expert by any means, but from, you know, a country boy's perspective, the best acting in one single movie I've ever seen, bar none. Uh, The story being a true story is just tremendously uh, and well told. It's a tremendous story, well told. And uh, let's bring country music into it for a moment here. First of all, let me mention that two country music personalities are in the movie. Uh, Jason Isbell, who plays um, the brother-in-law of one of the principal characters, played by Leonardo DiCaprio. And also Sturgill Simpson is in the movie, and Sturgill plays a moonshiner. So we have a couple of country music personalities in the movie. But what really attracted me, music-wise, about the movie, the music score was done by Robbie Robertson. Robbie died in 2023, in August, and he was a fantastic uh, music individual, a great guitarist. He was Bob Dylan's lead guitar player. Okay. He formed the band. Oh, really? Back in the 1970s. Yeah. He was a great writer. Levon Helm, the band. Here is a song that everybody will remember that Robbie wrote. The Night They Drove Old Dixie Down. Oh, yeah. Originally recorded by the band, but right. of course, John right. Baez right. had a tremendous hit with that. But anyway, Robbie, he scored the original music. But he went back, and this movie was set in the 20s and 30s, and he went back, and he obviously knew a lot about early country music, what I call vintage country music. 
And you know how you'll be watching a scene in a movie and there'll be music playing in the background? Oh, yeah. You will absolutely be knocked out with the music they play in the background during this movie. Wow. Let I can't give, wait. Let me give you a sample. Emmett Miller. Now, you may have never heard of Emmett Miller, many of people listening. Emmett Miller, uh, I got a call one time from Bonnie Owens, who at that time was married to Merle Haggard. Merle had done a, one of our shindig shows in Asheville, and Merle was a big fan of Jimmy Rogers. And back in the 1960s on WSKY, I put out a call for anybody who remembered Jimmy Rogers when he lived in Asheville. So I gathered together about half a dozen men who remembered Jimmy Rogers when he lived in Asheville back in the 1920s. And in the course of interviewing these people about Jimmy Rogers, and they talked about what Jimmy Rogers did in Asheville, and he mentioned that Jimmy Rogers learned to yodel from a man named Emmett Miller. And it's kind of, I didn't ask any further questions about Emmett Miller, about who he was or anything, just went on with the interview. And I gave the, the tapes that I had recorded to, to Merle Haggard because he was either had just recorded the, his Jimmy Rogers tribute album or was getting ready to. I don't remember which. But he was listening on his bus. out. They were out in Arizona somewhere to those tapes that I gave him. And the guy mentioned that Jimmy Rogers learned to yodel uh, from Emmett Miller, that they would practice their yodeling on Pack Square in downtown Asheville. Really? So I got a call from Bonnie Owens. Uh, they were married at the time, I believe, Merle Haggard and Bonnie Owens. And Bo Bonnie was on the bus, and they were out in Arizona. And she says, Merle wants to know if you know anything about Emmett Miller, who was mentioned in one of the tapes that you gave Merle. And I said, no, I don't know a thing about Emmett Miller because I really didn't, hadn't, didn't pay that much attention. So uh, sometime later, I got from Merle Haggard a, an album. He had started researching Emmett Miller, and he sent me this uh, album of Emmett Miller material that was recorded back in the 1920s. Now, Emmett Miller was a vaudeville performer. Uh, in, in the, the minstrels, and he did a lot of blackface. And he was the, you know, there are a lot of people down through history, not only in music, but otherwise, that don't get the recognition they deserve. Jimmy Rogers learned to yodel. Uh, he, he, he was taught by Emmett Miller. And, of course, a lot of people imitated Jimmy Rogers on down the line, including Merle Haggard, the yodeling right. and so forth. Right. Emmett Miller was born in Macon, Georgia. He moved to Asheville in 1925. And I don't know how long he lived in Asheville. He lived at least two years. And you know, uh, Ralph Peer of the Victor Talking Machine Company came to Bristol, Tennessee in 1927 and recorded what's called the Big Bang of country music. Right. He uh, recorded Jimmy Rogers, the Carter Family, the Stonemans, a lot of other people in Bristol, 1927. But two years before that, in 1925, uh, he came to Asheville and in a hotel, I'm not sure what hotel it was, the Langren or the Battery Pie, I don't know. But he recorded Emmett Miller in Asheville and several other people, two years before Bristol. Emmett Miller was not what you consider a country music star, but he wrote a song. It was recorded in Asheville in 1925 called Lovesick Blues. Emmett Miller was the first recorded artist to ever use the falsetto. Uh, of yodeling. Breaking the voice. You can probably imitate that, Randy. Uh, no, I can't. Uh, yeah, you can. Give it, us a little. I got the lovesick blues. I, ca I, love, I can't do yeah, it. You yeah. know, you know, <clears throat> and of course the lovesick blues. Became a tremendous hit for yeah. uh, years Williams. later for Hank Williams. Yeah. I played it the other day on my show. He also uh, wrote and recorded Anytime, which was a big hit by Eddie Anytime. Arnold. Anytime. Yeah. Yeah. You're feeling lonely. 
So, back to the movie. One of the background songs that you'll hear in the movie is Emmett Miller and Lovesick Blues, recorded in Asheville, North Carolina in 1925. Wow. How about that? Wow. Also in the movie, you'll hear the Carter family do a song called Single Girl, Married Girl. Roy Acuff and the Great Speckled Bird. There was a, a voice that I thought was Jimmy Rogers, but I'm the kind of guy that's the last person to leave a movie theater because I, I <laughs> wait for the credits to roll. <laughs> and picture this scene in your mind. I'm the only person in the movie theater. The movie's <laughs> over. The credits are rolling. I'm the only person in the movie theater. And I look around, and there's a young lady with a broom <laughs> waiting for me to leave so she can sweep up. So I'm trying to figure out all the people in the movie that the music people, the singers, the background music. And I thought it was Jimmy Rogers, it was a blues singer named uh, Henry Thomas, who did a song called I'm Going to Texas and Live on Easy Street. Sounded like Jimmy Rogers, but it was Henry Thomas, who was a, a, a black blues singer. Also, and this was recorded in Bristol at the Bristol Sessions in 1927, Where We'll Never Grow Old, the old gospel song by a man named Alfred Karn. You know, do a little bit of Never Grow Old. We'll never, never grow old, yes, we'll never grow old and in Al a land where we'll yeah. never grow old. Alfred Carnes was a preacher from up in uh, either southwest Virginia or uh, eastern Kentucky who came down and was recorded, and he went right back to preaching. His, his music did not, you know, sell big like Jimmy Rogers and the Carter family. And also, here's another one you can sing a little bit uh, of for us, Randy, that in the uh, movie, the Chuck Wagon Gang and a Beautiful Life. Each day I'll do, each day I'll do a golden deed. Yes, yes, yes. And, and, and another gospel song. And this was recorded in 1927. And the best in doing my research that I can determine, it's a, a choral group from a church. But they call themselves the Tennessee Mountaineers. And they do, Shall We Gather at the River. Shall we gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful, the river? Yeah. So you'll enjoy the movie. You'll enjoy the story. You'll appreciate the great acting, but you will uh, absolutely love hearing in the background these old vintage country and gospel and blues songs. I can't wait. Uh, you brought this up to me. Out, we, we were sitting out on the porch talking about what we were going to talk about today. And uh, I've, I've been seeing the promos for this movie and thinking, I got to go see Killers of the Flower Moon. And you just jumped all over it. So you want to stop right now and let's go. I'd like <laughs> to see it again. <laughs> I'm ready. And I do. I do plan to, to go a second time uh, and see the movie. And there's not many movies that I've ever gone to see for a second time but i plan to see this movie a second time well uh correct me if i'm wrong but isn't this a three and a half hour movie three and a half hours you're exactly right it's a long movie so be sure to uh do that bathroom chore before you go in and get a big bucket of popcorn <laughs> because you're going to be there for a long time you don't want to have to get up and leave and miss anything Th that to you know to keep my attention for three and a half hours. And that's, uh, quite a feat, but I, I think this movie will do it. De Niro looks absolutely brilliant in the pro. Oh, he is. He's fabulous. Brilliant. All the acting is, is just absolutely, absolutely great. And, 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 you know, you seldom see a movie these days that doesn't have uh, profanity and, and there may be a little in this movie, but, but very, very little. Uh, it's just, a, it's just, I can't go see it, folks. Go see it. Decide for yourself. Henry Thomas, let me mention another word about him. As I did some research, I thought it was Jimmy Rogers, but it was a, 
an African-American folk artist named Henry Thomas, who was the first folk artist to produce a significant body of recorded music by an African-American. He was an itinerant street musician and a musical hobo who rode the rails across the country. And so he had much the same kind of background, I guess, as, as did Jimmy Rogers. And that's why in the movie, he sounded like Jimmy Rogers. Well, I am, as you said, it's in the movie theaters now, and it will be released uh, to Apple TV and start streaming after uh, it plays in the movie theater. But it is uh, Martin Scorsese's request that you see it in the movie theater. I I distinctly remember seeing that. Well, you'll uh, you'll you'll I think agree with uh, what I'm saying. It's one of the best movies. I think uh, prior to seeing Killers of the Flower Moon, the only movie that I've ever wanted to see twice was way back when uh, I was in Asheville years and years ago in the 1960s when Dr. Zhivago came out. And I remember it played at the Imperial Theater, which is located on uh, Patton Avenue in downtown Asheville. There's a long line of people stretching all the way around Church Street to get in to see that movie. And I went to see it twice, Dr. Zhivago. But that's the only movie that I purposely made a point of going to see twice. And, but I'm going to see <laughs> The Killers of the Flower Moon twice. All right. Thank you so much, Dave. We appreciate it. Uh, the music, of course, is important to Dave and I because uh, we both spent so much time in country radio and uh, enjoyed it so much. I'm still there. Thank you so much for joining us on Hot Mike with Houston and Hogan. And uh, we've got a special episode coming up very soon. We're going to get a, uh, a reunion of the radio ranch country gentlemen coming up we're going to record that next thanks for joining us see you next time randy be sure to click the subscribe button for another episode of hot mic with randy houston and dave hogan